Normally we think of God as being a loving creator. But the Bible says there are certain things that he hates. Did you ever think of God hating something? Let us turn, and my thoughts is good. today is going to be God's hate list. <laughs> God's hate list. Turn to Proverbs, the sixth chapter. Let us read the list so that we won't be having to turn back to it when I refer to certain subjects in his hate list. Proverbs 6, beginning with verse 16 to verse 19. These six things doeth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. A lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord, discord among brethren. Now these things God actually hates. Perhaps as you read other scriptures, you might be able to find other things that God hates. But it boils down that God hates sin. Anything that's sinful, God hates. God has emotions. And throughout the scriptures, we can read from time to time that God got angry with his people for the way that they were living. And so this morning, we want to go sort of go through the list as to how other scriptures mentions them and help us to uh, judge ourselves as we look at these things that God does not want us to be part of or allow them to be a part of our life. A proud look. No, I don't think any of us enjoy being around an individual that radiates such a feeling. I've always said you might be smarter than me. You might, what's another adjective? Uh, uh, you might be more popular than I. That might be true. But just don't let me feel it. That's always been my attitude, right or wrong, as I've gone through life. And I've rubbed shoulders with a lot of people that's got more education than I have, who's able to speak better than me. But as our friendship grew, that was not a matter to be concerned about. But some being around someone sort of lets off that air <laughs> I didn't like to be around them. I avoided them when I could. A proud look. In Psalms, the 10th chapter. In Psalms, the 10th chapter, David, as he spoke to his creator, <clears throat> in Psalms, the 10th chapter, in the fourth verse, he says, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. 
someone who's proud. He feels that he has accomplished whatever it is in his life all by himself. I've always said, brethren, there is nothing that we have done in this life, there's nothing that we have accomplished in this life, but what God has allowed it, provided it to take place. <laughs> I've always wondered how could anyone feel look what I have done not just us alone but we can read about them in the scriptures Nebuchadnezzar that was his downfall as he looked out over his kingdom and he says look see what I have done what I have accomplished and God brought him down just as low as a human being could be brought without being put into the grave his mind was taken from him and it says that his fingernails grew like bird claws he ate grass like an animal. His mind was completely taken from him. In the end, he had acknowledged that it was God that did everything. Yes, it is God that gives us the health to live. It is God that gives us a position or work in life to provide for our families. It is God that gives us the mind to think. But the one who's proud, look what I have done. Look what I have accomplished. And the psalmist says here, the proud does not even consider giving God the credit for anything. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. He has no need, he thinks, of a God. In the 16th Psalm, David expresses these thoughts concerning pride. Or well, his Proverbs, I'm sorry. Proverbs, the 16th chapter. <clears throat> Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I looked up the word haughty here in connection with this verse here, and the haughty spirit is connected with the prideful look, the prideful attitude. Pride goeth before destruction. In other words, Pride can cause us to fail in life because we're depending upon ourselves rather than upon a higher power or even our friends. Sometimes there are times when we need and we have to depend upon our friends for certain matters in life. We like to get advice and and not only advice but also there are times when we need help in life and so are times when we need our friends pride can also cause us not to seek help 
in time of need. <clears throat> Pride calls us to, I just don't want to ask for, for help. I just don't want, that, 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 that's sort of like welfare. Well, brethren, there's times in life when perhaps we all might need, in, we, we all might need help. It's not a matter of we've done something wrong. The circumstances happens to all of us. And we should not have that prideful feeling that we don't want to ask for help. <clears throat> I told one friend one time who, when I offered some help to him and he refused. I said, do you want to deprive me of the blessing of helping you? I said it in a joking way. But helping others, we do get blessings. We feel blessed when we're able to help others. And so when we deprive them of helping us, when we have a dire need, we're robbing them of blessings also. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. A prideful look is something that God hates. As we read, begin to read the list. Then he says, a lying tongue. A lying tongue. Something that's quite prevalent in life. I was just, when I was flipping the TV yesterday, very seldom do I get that opportunity until the evening, but I don't know what I was doing during the daytime that, that I had that opportunity. But this judge was addressing a graduation class. I didn't stop to listen to her long, but nevertheless, oh, it was the news. They had, had her on the news. That's why I happened to hear her remarks. She said, when you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. But if you lie, you have to remember what you said so no, you will not say something else that will contradict that. Tell the truth and you'll not have to remember what you said because you'll always tell the same thing then as you remembered it. A lying tongue is something which God hates. And a lying tongue is something of which got this world into the situation that it is today. Turn to Genesis Genesis, the third chapter. <clears throat> God told Adam and Eve not to eat of, certain, a, of, a, of a certain tree in the Garden of Eden. And he says, if you eat of it, even if you touch it, you will die. And so Satan comes to the woman and he asked her, why don't you go ahead and eat? Look, it so, looks so appetizing and so good to, looks so good to eat. But the woman remembered the instruction that she had received. He said, no, we can't. If we do, we're going to die. But in the fourth verse of Genesis 3, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. The first lie we find in the scriptures, the opportunity that man comes, approaches unto, to stay with the instructions 
that was given them. Not to listen to something contrary to what God had instructed them. But the woman, she stopped and she began to reason. That was her downfall. When we try to reason with sin, we're in danger of losing the battle. Rather than sticking with the thought, I can't do it, I was told not to do it, I told the, was told the results if I participated in it, but no, I begin to reason. I begin to reason. And uh, I might try to reason with myself. The flesh, in other words, desires it. Or it might be a situation. I begin to reason, well, if I don't, this is going to affect my family. We try to reason Rather than saying God told us not to do it, and that's enough. There's no need of trying to reason with it. There's no out about it. So many times, especially on television, and it's sad to realize that people follow what they listen to on television as the gospel and when a discussion comes up the right and wrong about it they try to reason from the human standpoint well surely God understands yes he understands he told us not to and that's the end of it as far as God is concerned he told us not to do it. But the lying tongue came along and it got our, the first family upon this earth to disobey. And how that one act, that one act has affected the generations and the multitudes of people down through time. So many times we are tempted to do something and we feel, well, it's my life. It's my life. I ought to be able to do with it what I want to do with it. We don't stop and think how it's going to affect those around us. And sin has its consequences, brethren. Sin has its consequences. And many times, far too many times, it's far-reaching. Not just us, ourselves. Yes, <clears throat> how that one sin has affected the world. In 1 Corinthians, the first, the first Corinthians 15, Paul, as he wrote to the church, he writes about this very thing that I've just mentioned from Genesis. 1 Corinthians 15 and the 22nd verse. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice the first part of this verse. For as in Adam all die. That's the effect that Eve's sin had upon the human race. She sinned and then she enticed her husband and he sinned. And that sin was pronounced upon the generations after them. Doesn't seem fair, does it, to us today as we reason concerning the thought 
Why should we have to suffer because of Adam and Eve? Well, brethren, that's what God said. You eat of it and you shall die. Adam lived for 930 years, but he died. He died just as God said he would. And so we might at first seem to think we got away with it. But later on, what we did begins to affect others around us. A lying tongue is something that God hates. Hand that shed innocent blood. Back in Genesis again in the fourth chapter. Genesis, the fourth chapter. It's recorded for us to read today and learn from it. In Genesis 4 and verse 8, it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. First murder in the scriptures. The first death in the scriptures. <clears throat> Innocent blood was shed. Notice the four part of the verse. It says, and Cain talked with Abel. If you have a different translation, it probably would read, and Cain quarreled with Abel. They had a quarrel. We're not told what the quarrel was about. Whether you read back prior to this, and they both brought an offering to God, Abel brought of the, he brought an animal sacrifice. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and he refused Cain's sacrifice. If the quarrel was over that, we do not know. It's a little hard for me to, well, I guess you, knowing human nature, those who want to pick a quarrel can pick it over most anything. But if they had a quarrel, it should have been with God. He was the one that accepted one and refused the other. And there's a difference of opinion as to why God accepted one and re refused the other. One side of the argument is that Abel brought an animal sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and that's what should have been brought. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. But I have a sort of a different opinion about that. My Bible, Bible tells me in 1 John that Cain's attitude was sinful when he brought the offering. His life was filled with sin when he brought it. And I do believe that that is why God refused his offering. It's because he was not of the right mind, the right attitude, the right feeling when he brought it and gave it. For in the book of Genesis, we do not find a, they should bring a certain thing for a certain purpose in the scriptures. But nevertheless, that's a matter of opinion we can surmise, but we're not told as to exactly what the quarrel was over. 
<clears throat> but hands that shed innocent blood is something that God hates. In the same chapter in verse 10, after he killed his brother, we find in verse 10, God speaking to him. And he said, what hast thou done? The, notice now, the voice of thy brother's blood, innocent blood seemingly has a voice that God hears. He takes notice. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And when I read this, my thought goes beyond the taking of Abel's life. I cannot help but think of the millions and millions of abortions that have been committed, that have been done. The blood of the innocent the doctors that took their lives. <clears throat> President Reagan expressed it so clearly and so wonderfully. When the people was arguing with him about abortion, a woman has a right to decide what she does with her body. And we are reminded of those words that President Reagan remarked. Who's going to stand up for the rights of the baby? Amen. Who's going to stand up for the rights? of those innocent children. Don't they have some rights? When a baby is conceived, it is a human being. From the beginning, and it needs to be protected until it is born and matures and he's able to make decisions on his own. Someone has to watch over him and protect him. That has been the plan of God. But to take innocent blood, God hates. And to have an abortion after a child has been conceived is nothing short of murder. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. In the sixth chapter of Genesis, we find at the time of the flood, Genesis 6 and verse 5, God is speaking, he says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the very imagination, notice that, the very imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Our thoughts, brethren, if we dwell upon them to the point we begin to enjoy it, that is sin. For Satan to plant the thought in our mind, brethren, is not sin. But if we allow it to stay there, to linger, to enjoy it, and we keep thinking and keep building upon it, that is sin. That is sin. And God hates 
a heart that devises imagination. Heart is not talking about the heart that pumps your blood or my blood. It's talking about the inner man, the inner mind that thinks, plans, and enjoys it. God hates imaginations. They're evil imaginations. Oh, the, the inner man, I tell you, is something else. Turn to Matthew 15. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, Jesus himself explains the human nature. Matthew 15 and verse 19. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things that can dwell and come out of the inner man. And Jesus says they are that which defile us. It defiles the body. Yes, it can if we allow it. If we dwell upon it, enjoy it. Well, I'm not hurting nobody. Well, we're hurting God's feelings because he doesn't want us to do it. And the Bible says, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are good report, think on these. Think on these. I don't know why, but seem like there's always the, some of the individuals that seems to think that how can I explain it that, that you're saying that you're something special when you say that and you explain that you do not allow your mind to continue to dwell to where it becomes sin Most generally, when you t talk about sin and they say, well, I sin every day, I'd venture to say that that's what they're alluding to. The thought again that comes across our mind, it in itself is not sin, but it's when we allow it to linger. We have control over that. We don't have control over the thought that Satan places in our mind, but we have thought, uh, control over the thought. We do have control. And we can dismiss it from our minds before it can take root and begin to grow into our nature and our desires. God hates a heart of the inner man, in other words, that devises wicked imaginations. Our last thought, he hates the individual that sows discord among the church, among the brethren. <clears throat> Proverbs, the 26th chapter. Proverbs, the 26th chapter. The wise man, as he writes about our thought. Proverbs 26 and verse 20. He says, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Now that's easy to understand, isn't it? We have a fire in the fireplace. You don't put, don't put any more wood on it. The fire goes out. 
So where there is no talebearer, the strife ceases. The talebearer keeps things going, keeps things stirred up. But if the manner ceases to be told anymore, it stops. God hates an individual that continues stirring up discord among the church family. <clears throat> but I thought it would be good for us to think of something maybe we've never given much thought to. Turn to Titus, the first chapter, that this could overflow into. Titus, the first chapter. Paul, as he writes to his helper, Titus, the first chapter, begin with the 10th verse. He says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's talking about his own nationality. And he says, Whose mouths must be stopped? Who subvert, who houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. He's referring to those who are teaching false doctrine, false teaching. And the church has to protect itself. And in our church, we have a way that helps in protecting the church, and that's the ministerial council. If I don't stay in line with the teaching of the church, I am called in question. And that ought to be done. We have what we call democracy in our church. Not one individual makes the decision. But as I thought on this, now Paul was one that was teaching the truth. There's no doubt about it. He was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I couldn't help but think back to the time of the when the Catholic Church began to sway its power over the rest of the body. If there hadn't have been some within the church who stayed with the truth, the truth would have been lost. And I'm sure that the Pope said, get rid of those, their mouths must be stopped. And when a while ago when I said the, on the other side of the coin, I'm sure the Catholic Church thought that they were sowing discord because the truth they wanted to stamp out. Should we do away with democracy in the church because some such a occasion might occur? No, brethren, I still am in favor of democracy. It's not a guarantee, no, but it's the best that I know. And if I'm staying with the truth, then I must leave it up to God to take care of it. Just as those during before the Reformation or when the Catholic Church started, they stayed with the truth. 
God watched over them and then he blessed and he protected them. Eventually came out as to who was right and who was wrong. <clears throat> they were not sowing discord because they held to the truth. I just thought that I would bring this thought to us so that if by chance we do have the truth and staying with the truth and proclaiming the continued truth, don't, dis don't get discouraged because the church as a whole turned against you. Leave it to God. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. My closing text, Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Paul is using diplomacy here in <clears throat> talking to the church. Now, seemingly most in the church had left the truth. And Paul, he's not unhappy. He's not scolding them necessarily. Galatians 4, verses 15 and 16. He says, where is then the blessedness you spoke, he spake of? For I bear you record that if I had been, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and would have given them to me. He's talking about there was a time when they were really supporting Paul. He said, I had your support so strongly, there was nothing you wouldn't do for me. Notice verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, he's using diplomacy. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't shake off the dust of those his feet against them. But the church could say, Paul, you're sowing discord. So let us hold to the truth. Even such should happen. I pray God that it doesn't. But we've known by the experience down through time that it has happened. It has happened. It's not us that's sowing discord, dis discord but it is those who are teaching false teaching. So this is the list that God hates. We've read it before. We've thought on the thoughts before. But it's always good to refresh our minds because we never know when these things will come our way also and we have to decide. God bless us is my prayer.